will come to the special interviews. So this time is uh, our great pleasure to, to have uh, Professor Hitoshi Murayama to our interviews. Uh, he is now the director of Cavi Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. So the name is very inspiring of the universe yes. at the University of Tokyo. So he got the Yukawa Commemoration Prize in 2002. So the Yukawa name from in the honor of Professor Hideki Yukawa, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He is the first Japanese Nobel laureate. That's that's very important. Okay, we have some questions uh, to to ask Professor Murayama, and hope that we can keep our uh, keep some inspiring uh, for for the young uh, generation. We'll so, see. <laughs> firstly, uh, what do you love most uh, about science and research? Well, the, the the thing I love the most about science and research is the moment you understood something. Wow. Uh, you know, just like the old stories by Archimede, mm -hmm. he was given this problem from the king mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, king suspects the new crown he had made yes. uh, is supposed to be made of pure gold, but he thought that the, actually the craftsman mixed some silver in mm -hmm. to steal some money out of the king. Mm -hmm. So he asked Archimede to, to see if there's any mixture of the silver in the crown. And Archimede had to think very hard to uh, uh, understand how he can actually tell them apart yeah. because you can't break the crown to mm -hmm. measure the volume to understand a specific weight. Mm -hmm. Then he went to the public bath. When he went into the bath, water overflowed. Mm -hmm. Then he realized that he can measure the volume of the crown mm -hmm. without destroying it, just by dipping in water mm -hmm. and measuring the amount of water that overflowed. So he got so excited that he ran back home all completely naked, right? <laughs> so that's the kind of excitement you feel when you understand something. Yeah. So science today is exactly the same. You try very hard to answer some question. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you run into dead end. You don't succeed. But once in a while, you do succeed, and then you come up with an answer. Yeah. And that's a great moment. You get really excited by it. And that's what I love about science. So you, you love the Juleka moment. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think many scientists like, like that moment also. But most of the time, we, we, we found that uh, the experiment becomes fail. Right, exactly. <laughs> and theories also fail. We need to tolerate to that. Right, right. Okay. The next question. How how come how you come up with a good research question? Uh, that's an excellent question by, <laughs> by itself. Uh, it's very difficult, mm -hmm. as you know. Um, so what we say is that follow the good nose. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't become immediately clear what is the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. If your questions are too ambitious, yes. then you will not be able to answer that question uh, in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. But if the question is too immediate, mm -hmm. then you, you don't make a great advance by asking those That's questions. Right. So you need to find the, the questions which you can hopefully answer at mm -hmm. some level, but it's not trivial enough, mm -hmm. and, but uh, that will really contribute to the advancement of science in your field, and that's a very difficult thing to do. So that's why I said, follow your nose. Mm -hmm. You smell out and mm -hmm. try to see where the smell is coming from. And sometimes you run into dead ends, mm -hmm. but once in a while you do succeed. So, so that's the only way. So that the way you can sort of smell the right question is by keep, keeping your mind very open mm -hmm. and, and, and try to know as much as you can so that when you see a problem, you can recognize that is a problem. Yes. If you don't study broadly enough, then you may be very narrowly focused on one particular field and you may not be find, able to find many good collections of questions yes. that you can address one of them yourself. And, but if you actually look broadly enough, mm -hmm. then you, sometimes you do find a question which looks good, which may be answerable, which may be doable, but not trivial. And, mm -hmm. and that's where you follow the nose. Okay. Follow your nose. That, that very good situation. <coughs> Is normally for the scientists we be familiar with the, the term uh, on on the giant shoulders. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we we need if the question is very big, maybe we, we just can answer just a, a part of it. Right. Well, that's always the case. That's always the case. Okay. Next. Uh, what kind of impact or contribution of your research? Well, the, my research is to uh, answer some of the really basic questions about the universe. Mm -hmm. So they don't have direct applications in a way. So the questions we're asking are things like, 
how did the universe begin, mm -hmm. where it's going, mm -hmm. what it's made of, yes. what are its laws, and where do we exist in it. Mm -hmm. And answering any of these questions may not change the world in a sort of a tangible way mm -hmm. immediately. But if you think about it in the, in the history of the humankind, we have been always driven by these questions. Right. When this, uh, the, uh, the, the geocentric view of mm -hmm. the world changed the heliocentric view, mm -hmm. you know, people really killed each other. Mm -hmm. It's awful, but what it shows is that we care so much about these fundamental questions. It doesn't affect our life directly, but it's part of the way we are. We are curious beings. We really would, would like to understand these basic questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Why are we are here? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is really part of our sort of curious mind uh, of the humanity. So I think that's one of the, uh, the, the very basic contributions to humankind. The second contribution mm -hmm. is sort of surprising by conducting this kind of basic research. Yes. Quite often, we find some important technologies that will make this kind of research possible, mm -hmm. which turn out to be very useful. Mm -hmm. The one famous example is the World Wide Web. This was invented at CERN, where yes. people were running these giant particle accelerators, trying to mimic the conditions of a big pan in the laboratory. But by doing this experiment, people came up with the needs of trying to share data yeah. uh, across different nations uh, working on a single experiment. And there came the invention of World Wide Web mm -hmm. for the way of researchers to exchange information on the experimental data. But that actually turned out to be, I don't know, maybe trillion dollar business mm -hmm. these days. You can't imagine any business with a World Wide Web anymore. Mm -hmm. So this really changed the world in a way, not in a way that was anticipated originally for the purpose, but in an unanticipated way that we really flourish these days and we can't live without it. So, so many things we use every day came from basic research. A GPS, which we also need just to figure out where we are driving, where we have to go, uh, uh, couldn't have been possible without Einstein theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are so many examples uh, that came up from basic research, just trying to understand the way the universe works, that turned out to be actually lead to technologies we are really benefiting from. I think if you have time, uh, Professor Murayama can give more and more uh, answers and, and examples on this. And, and it's very interesting, uh, some uh, impact, for example, the, the the World Wide Web, uh, it's, it's good to, to have it for free because if, if it's limited to, to in, in some constraint, for example, mm -hmm. we have to pay, mm -hmm. pay much for it, it's maybe, maybe not like nowadays. That's right. That's right. Okay. okay. Can any ordinary children become a great scientist? What do you, what do you think? Well, absolutely, <laughs> because any sign, if you ask them, were at one point an ordinary mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. But how, I think it's just being curious. Mm -hmm. You know, if the child is curious, mm -hmm. a child would ask questions to parents and teachers, why is it this way, why is that that way? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, being curious, at least in my mind, means, first of all, you ask questions. And second, you demand answers. Uh -huh. And this combination is exactly what science is about. Mm -hmm. You need to come up with a set of questions. I told, about, told you about this following the nose. Mm -hmm. You need to come up with your own set of questions. Then you demand answers, which means you really would like to devote yourself trying to answer those questions yourself. And that's the research. Mm -hmm. So just by being curious, and if parents and, and their teachers are helpful enough to develop the curiosity, nourish them further, then you can become a great scientist, I believe. So it uh, must be difficult because not every society uh, support the, the others to, to answer all the questions from the children. That's exactly right. So uh, children need to get help from the, the parents uh, they can interact with. I mentioned parents and teachers. But these days, you can also read on the internet. Uh -huh. I gave a uh, online course on mm -hmm. the Big Bang Theory. Oh, the yeah. title was from Big Bang to Dark Energy. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised to see 50,000 people signed up for my online courses. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so if you're looking for opportunities beyond the people you can interact with directly, you can find a lot of resources on the internet these days. Mm -hmm. Many of them are free, and you can make use of them. So if you're inquisitive enough, if we really would like to understand the questions answered, then look around, Google up, then sometimes you will be able to get great answers and help on the internet. Yeah, that's very practical. <laughs> uh, okay. You, you tell, tell us about the impact of science. So how you convince, 
convince the people that uh, do not believe in science or, or don't pay much attention. For example, you, 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 your work on the very basic science. So how, how to request to the politician to give you big money to do the research? Oh, that's a, that's a question <laughs> asked I care about. <laughs> well, that, that's an important question too. So I think I will start on two fronts. Mm -hmm. One of them is the highest, how sciences has been contributing mm -hmm. to the benefits of the humankind in many tangible ways. Yeah. And second, uh, how science would relate to the kind of questions people do ask about mm -hmm. themselves. On the first front, I, I hope that's actually pretty easy because without science, we wouldn't have any, any electricity at home, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have running water, mm -hmm. no cars, no TV, that's no right. iPhone. You know, so this is actually pretty obvious that science is absolutely necessary uh -huh. to sustain people's lives these days. Um, of course, some of them are a little obscure. I mentioned GPS, mm -hmm. and then you know it's, it's a total black box for most people. So we have to tell people how exactly those things work and what scientific principles they are based on. So that requires some work from the scientist side. But I think it it's becomes pretty clear immediately that science has done a lot to improve human lives and our very uh, basic aspects of their daily life for everybody these days. Second part is a little bit more difficult, and, and scientists tend to be not good at explaining what, why they're doing research, That's because right. what we do is very technical, very complicated to explain, but we should make our own effort mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. in communicating why we do science, why we are so curious about certain things, why we conduct so and so experiments, and, and, and in a way that and anybody can relate to. So the way I try to explain my uh, research interests, why did the universe start, where uh, the universe is going, why do we exist in it, is, is my effort trying to make questions clear to anybody so that they can relate those questions and will be curious about, will be interested in, and hopefully will be willing to support. So the, every scientist should make that kind of effort trying to explain what their science is about mm -hmm. in a way anybody can relate to. And so uh, that we get more uh, understanding from the general public and also politicians who control money. That's right. <laughs> so uh, we must do it in the board way to, to give and to communicate effectively. Yeah, yeah, very good answer, and suggestions. Absolutely. So if you have any short uh, suggestions for a young generation, uh, you, you can have some means. Well, let's see. So uh, what do you study in school? It's mostly about kind of things that had been understood, let's say, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to remember the names of scientists, what they have done, yeah. and there's no context to that, right? <laughs> and you're supposed to memorize. You should be able to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not very exciting, uh, at least for me, when I was a little kid. But when you, when I read stories about scientists, that's very different. I mentioned the story about Archimedes running back home all naked because of the excitement. Uh, Newton and Hooke were big rivals. They never liked each other. Uh, uh, Galileo actually had to move around to make more money to sustain musician who was his brother. Yeah. There are all kind of human stories behind these great scientific achievements. Yeah. They struggled a lot. They, they had to work hard. Sometimes they were misled. They go into false leads. And, and once you understand that this is really human activities, not something that's explained in one paragraph in textbook, but there's a lot behind it, behind that story. Mm -hmm. Then you, you tend to like more about science. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage students to read up on those stories. Mm -hmm. I hope teachers will do that as well, mm -hmm. to see the stories behind scientific discoveries, because that's what I want young people to jump into and do them yourselves. That's a very good conclusion. So uh, we do not only learn about science, but we need to learn about the humanity in, in scientists how to have to learn about the history of science and history of scientists also. So thank you for watching. Bye.